Greetings YouTubers, today I'm going to be starting a new series, the Spherical Distance Formula, yet another stake through the heart of Flat Earth. Long time viewers of the channel will doubtless recognise this slide. This is a reformulation of the Spherical Cosine Formula, which can be used to accurately estimate the great circle distance between any two points of known latitude and longitude on Earth's surface. And this alone is enough to demonstrate that the Earth must be at least approximately spheroidal. But the headaches for flat earthers are only just beginning. Primary school geometry teaches us that on a planar surface, you can easily have three equidistant points. These would be the points on the vertices of an equilateral triangle. That's what equilateral means. But as soon as you try and introduce a fourth point on the same planar surface, things go awry. This new point can be equidistant from two of the vertices, but the distance between the new point and the third vertex of the equilateral triangle can never be made to work. This limitation disappears as soon as one moves into three dimensions. That additional point can just be placed above the equilateral triangle at an equal distance from each of the vertices, creating a tetrahedron. So if we can find a set of four points all on the same surface, such that the points are equidistant from one another, then that surface cannot be planar. We can now use this result to determine whether or not Earth's surface is planar. If Earth's surface contains four points that are equidistant from one another, then it cannot be planar. This table shows four points, Dumpy Creek, Australia, Goljo, Kenya, Portozuelo, Chile, and a point in Inuvik, Canada. The angular separation between each pair of points is shown in blue above the diagonal of the table. The great circle distance approximation between each pair of points is shown in red below the diagonal. These results were all obtained using the spherical distance approximation shown previously. Here I'm showing the four proposed vertices of our tetrahedron on a Robinson global projection. If you're good at three-dimensional visualization, you may be able to imagine this projection wrapped around the surface of a sphere and the configuration that the four points will adopt. Okay, so the spherical distance formula tells us that these four points are equidistant on Earth's surface. A skeptical person might well ask, what is the evidence that that claim is correct? Well, I am so glad you asked. We will start with azimuthal equidistant map projections. Each such map projection has a central point, the center of the map. The distance between this central point and any other point on the map is a scalar multiple of the real world distance between the two points. Points that are an equal distance away from the central point in the real world will plot onto a circle in the map. This particular style of map projection is very useful when considering a physical phenomenon that radiates outward from a central point. Examples include earthquakes, tsunamis, or missile launches from a particular location. For our purposes, what really matters is that when we use one vertex of our tetrahedron as the center point of the map, then the other vertices all lie on a circle, just as we predicted. Our skeptical interlocutor might well say, well, so what? That's a circular argument. You're saying that spherical maps agree with the spherical distance formula. Show me some real world examples. So let's move on to commercial flight times. Sadly, there aren't commercial flights between these exact locations, so I've had to do some approximations. This table lists embarkation and debarkation points and their coordinates, along with the flights that connect them, and the average flight time averaged over the inbound and the return flights. I have taken these average flight times and multiplied them by the velocity of the planes, 930 kilometers an hour, to get the maximum distance that these planes could have flown in that amount of time. I have made no allowance for air traffic control maneuvers, or for the plane to get to elevation, or for the effect of wind patterns. In the final column, I list the spherical distance approximation between each pair of points, and compare that with the result from the previous calculation. We can then see that the misfit between the spherical distance approximation and the flight travel time is less than 15%, and that agreement would be further improved if we allowed a realistic time for maneuvering and for the aircraft to get to cruising altitude. Now obviously there's no direct flight from Dumpy Creek to Portozuelo, so I've had to use Sydney to Santiago as a proxy. Nonetheless, the flight time between Sydney and Santiago agrees well with their spherical distance separation, which in turn agrees well with the spherical distance estimation between Dumpy Creek and Portozuelo. We can similarly use Brisbane to Vancouver to approximate Dumpy Creek to Inuvik. And again, we can see that flight time and spherical distance separation are entirely consistent. The closest major international airport hub to Kenya is in Dubai. Using Brisbane to Dubai to test the separation of Goljo and Dumpy Creek, we see that the flight time is entirely consistent with the estimated spherical distance. 
A similar result is obtained using Dubai to Seattle as a proxy for Goljo Inovic, or using Dubai Sao Paulo as a proxy for Goljo Portozuelo. In summary, the flight times, which are publicly available and observable, are entirely consistent with the spherical distance formula. But flat earthers have a long track record of ignoring flight time data, invoking magic winds or pilot shenanigans or some grand conspiracy. So let's move on to submarine cables. The number of submarine cables relevant to this conversation is vastly smaller than the number of flight times available to us. Nonetheless, they remain an important data set. The reason for this is twofold. First of all, the commercial aspect. Creating a submarine cable connection between two continents is actually ferociously expensive, costing upwards of a million dollars per kilometer for the cable to be laid. In this context, both parties, the company paying for the cable to be laid and the company that is actually doing that, both have very strong financial incentives to pay meticulous attention to exactly how much cable is used and what the costs are. Neither company nor their shareholders will willingly shoulder the legal and financial consequences of underestimating or overestimating how much cable has been prepared. The second reason that this is such an important data set is more mundane. It's that the length of these cables can be independently verified once the cables have been laid. The length of the cable can be easily and repeatably verified by timing how long it takes a signal to get from one end of the cable to the other and back again. For instance, the time it takes a signal to travel from Hillsborough, Oregon to Sydney, Australia along the Hawaii submarine cable is 135 milliseconds, corresponding to a latency of 1 millisecond per 100 kilometers. A similar latency rate of 1 millisecond per 100 kilometers is observed along the Oman Australia cable between Perth and Muscat. Obviously, submarine cables cannot be kept perfectly taut. And to facilitate maintenance and operation, their paths tend to veer a little bit to pass through island centers such as Hawaii, the Cocos Keeling Islands, or the Solomon Islands. Even allowing for these imprecisions, the lengths of these submarine cables accord very well with what we would expect based on the spherical distance approximation. One of my earliest interactions with a flat earther was with one with the rather inappropriate appellation Brian's Logic. I understand that he has since moved on to such grand things as inventing sky miles and misidentifying cloud banks as mountain ranges. But at the time of our mercifully brief interaction, his main concern seemed to be that the Earth must be flat because GPS uses Cartesian coordinates. It's now time to revisit this particular Flat Earth classic. First of all, I went to the IGS website and found the four IGS stations closest to our four proposed vertices. Those IGS stations are plotted here as black circles. IGS stands for the International GNSS Service and GNSS stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. I really hate nested acronyms. In this table, I've listed the identifiers of the four IGS sites, their latitude, longitude, and elevation, and their Cartesian coordinates in the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. We can now test whether or not these four points are a coplanar set. Given any three arbitrary points in three-dimensional space, as long as those points are non-degenerate and not collinear, they will define a plane. That plane will be orthogonal to the cross product of B minus A and C minus A. It's not really important that you understand what a cross product is, other than the cross product of any two vectors is orthogonal to both those vectors. If we introduce a fourth point D, then D is in the same plane as A, B, and C, if D minus A is also orthogonal to the cross product of B minus A and C minus A, which is equivalent to saying that the dot product of D minus A and the cross product is equal to zero. If the dot product of D minus A and that cross product is non-zero, we can actually calculate how far the point D is from the plane defined by A, B, and C using the formula above. Again, it's not really important whether or not you know what dot products or cross products are. All that's important is that these are well-defined mathematical functions and you can just plug them into an appropriate program. If you do that with the IGS sites presented here, you will find that point D is almost 9,000 kilometers away from the plane defined by A, B, and C. We conclude from this that the Earth is not even approximately planar. Now that we have Cartesian coordinates, we can calculate Cartesian distances, but these can't be compared directly with great circle distances. 
Instead, the correct comparison is to compare Cartesian distances to chord lengths, which can be easily calculated using simple trigonometry. Doing this for the vertices of our tetrahedron, we see that the chord length separating them should be 10,404 kilometers. We can now directly compare this estimate against the Cartesian distances between the IGS sites. In this table, I present the Cartesian distances between the IGS sites in blue above the diagonal and the great circle approximations between them below the diagonal in red. Results that the Cartesian distances between the IGS sites are in good agreement with the estimate we obtained in the last slide. It is worth emphasizing that the x, y, and z coordinates for these stations are derived from observational data. The Cartesian coordinates can be converted into latitude and longitude, but latitude and longitude can also be estimated using astronomical observations. We therefore have two independent data sets that can be compared against one another. We can use these two data sets to obtain some interesting insights into Earth's geometry. For instance, the latitude of a particular site can be accurately determined by carefully observing the angle of elevation to the nearest pole of celestial rotation. But this value is closely associated with the z-value estimated from GPS observations. This is very well explained if the Earth is approximately spheroidal. In that case, there is a very direct functional relationship between the z-value of a point on Earth's surface and its latitude. In this table, we compare the z-value estimated using a very simple spheroidal approximation against the observed z-value for each site. We see that the difference between the observed z-value and the calculated z-value is quite small, at most 20 kilometers or so. At all points, the discrepancy between the two techniques is less than 1%. Another technique available to us to verify whether or not these points are actually the vertices of a tetrahedron is to look at their angles of intersection. If we take a top-down view of a tetrahedron, so that there is a central vertex in the middle, the edges from the other vertices meet at that vertex at an angle of exactly 120 degrees. Spherical trigonometry gives us exactly the same result for any spherical triangle with sides 109.47 degrees. And when we test this using visualization or navigational software, that is exactly the result that we obtain. Okay, what I tried to demonstrate in this video is that the Great Circle Distance Approximation is entirely consistent with commercial flight times, submarine cable lengths, and GPS coordinate locations. I also demonstrated, using the Spherical Distance Formula and GPS Site Coordinates, that it is not possible for Earth's surface to be planar. The geometry of the points considered in this episode is such that Earth's surface must be three-dimensional, and it must have a vertical dimension at least three orders of magnitude larger than can be accounted for by topography. Okay, so that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching to the end. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you'll join me next time when I'll be discussing lies that flurfs tell.